here's the thing. So a couple of years ago, I was just um, telling uh, one of my producers about this, but so this was probably like two, three years ago. I had not been home to Toronto in quite a while, or at least not spent like a substantial amount of time there. And I spent the summer in Toronto. It was a time of my life. I love Toronto so much. I miss it. I long for it. But as I'm like, you know, getting back into like the vibe of the city and checking things out, the Arkells are everywhere. Like <laughs> We're everywhere. Trying. Oh my God. I feel like you guys are like Toronto's band. Does it feel that way to you? Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to... a weird thing to answer, but. No, I mean, it's nice that we, that we know we can, you know, put a show up on sale and, and people are going to come. You know, I think every artist, no matter their size is always worried about like, are people going to come to the gig? Like I even um, sure. uh, heard an interview with Chris Martin from Coldplay and he was talking about, he's like, you know, it doesn't matter that we've like sold out stadiums around the world. Like the thing that keeps me up at night is that like, we're not moving enough tickets in Pittsburgh. It's like <laughs> Pittsburgh is <laughs> right now. No one's coming to that. We're, we're way behind schedule in Pittsburgh. And like, and I think every band has a version of that. So it's like, whether you're playing clubs or bigger theaters or you're you know doing amphitheaters or whatever it's always just like what's what's the next step how can we keep growing it but uh yeah no we we feel very lucky that like we don't have real jobs i always try to just put it in that perspective right just like when are they going to tell us that we have to go back and get a real job and so i think about that that all the time and i'm like what would my resume look like what would i do i have no (laughs) idea well what would you do if you had to do a regular job what would you like gravitate towards I'd be I feel bad. Like I just, like, I'm gonna go be a waitress, I guess. I don't know. I'm I very I don't have much to offer except I can have a great conversation. Yeah, it's a good question. I like delegating because I'm not really good at anything, but I like working with people that are good at stuff. Like I I like having big picture ideas or feelings, and I think that happens when you're writing songs uh, and you're putting together like a show, you know, with your band. But like when it comes to like the execution of like what a light shade looks like on the stage or like a a mix looks like, like I'm bad at all that stuff. So I really rely on on the team around me to do anything. Uh, So, yeah, but to answer your question, I don't know. I I, have to find another job. You would flounder out in the real world. You would not do well. Oh, absolutely. And I think I actually have a good work ethic now. But I think if it was something I didn't care about, I'd be so lazy i'd be so lazy I'd, and i'd be a bad employee yeah that was me when I, my last waitressing job was at the black bull on uh, queen west baby oh, queen right there i walked right oh, by yeah. it this morning yeah. what a great spot that was my last place mm-hmm. i waitress and i remember i like enjoyed working there because you didn't really have to be a good waitress it wasn't about like you didn't have to charm anybody you were kind of in and out i was like hey i can handle this that yeah. like the no bullshit i can i can kind of do that not so not so bad i um, got fired from my last uh real job uh, at serving at Eastside mario's in, in dundas ontario <laughs> i miss Eastside mario's so much <laughs> I, what's the american I, equivalent yeah, um, just <laughs> i would it would got to, i mean i guess the olive garden which we had olive garden in canada for about yeah. 30 seconds and it, yeah, it did not last. last i know mm-hmm. it's so it's so weird to me how things succeed in Canada and don't succeed in the United States and vice versa. It's so bizarre to me. Um, I don't understand like what kind of makes that go. I mean, even in like, for like our careers, it like, do you, did you always, did you guys ever want to go to the United States and try to like work down here? Or did you kind of want to stay in in Canada? Yeah. I mean, we've we've been touring down in the States uh, consistently. We've been touring in the UK, uh, in Germany, pretty consistently for like the last, uh, you know, probably eight years. And um, the way we try to think about it is that it's just like any amount of success anywhere is incredibly difficult. And, you know, there's so many examples of groups that like headline festivals in the UK and then they come to America and do, you know, 200 cap clubs and yeah. vice versa too. There's, yeah. there's bands that are massive in America that could be selling out 3000 cap rooms all across the country. So but, weird. you know, if they go to Germany, nobody cares. So we sort of try to take every kind of market uh, as its own case. And we're like, okay, if we can move a few more tickets or win over that many more people in you know, Chicago, is it better than the last time we played in Chicago? Yeah. And that's the way we try to try to rationalize everything. So, uh, so it, it's easy to sort of, I think, get in your own head about like what success means. 
But I, for us, it's like, as long as we're not working a real job and we're like creatively satisfied every day, then that's sort of like, I think the goal for, for well, us. I mean, you guys are doing incredibly well. Um, are there U.S. markets or U.S. towns that you do better in? Uh, I'd say the places we've just been, been more. So like we're playing like House of Blues in Chicago. Uh, we're playing Urban Plaza. We're playing the 930 Club in D.C., and uh, those are like kind of like the 930 Club is like that legendary venue. It's like kind of regularly voted like the best kind of 1200 cap club in the country. Yeah. Uh, so for us, even getting to play there is like, oh, this is this is exciting. This is awesome. So, uh, yeah, we don't have any West Coast states yet. We're in L.A. area, by the way. We, we were actually, working down so there a lot. I'm not in L.A. anymore. I was oh. actually living in Las Vegas for a while. Um, and I just Vegas. moved to Cincinnati like two months ago. Cincinnati? What's going on yes. in Cincinnati? I miss <laughs> this. So, Cause it's new. It's new. And I've, I've not really posted all that much about it. Uh, I mean, I've spoken about it, but anyway, so my husband's from here originally mm. and we're living out in Las Vegas. We have a baby. That's no place to raise a baby. Let's <laughs> get real. Hanging out in the casinos all it's, day, the baby in the casino. You can smoke indoors. It's like yeah. the wild west out there. I also like, God, like I was saying, it's like, I miss Canada terribly. This mm. is as close as I can get right now. So I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take uh, it. I get, I'm moving north. I'll take it. That's interesting. Where in Toronto are you from? So I actually grew up in Ajax. Okay. East yeah. Cool. I grew up in Ajax, but before I left living in Toronto, I was living at Lakeshore and Bathurst and like the tip top Taylor lofts. Oh, uh, nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, that's so cool. That's amazing. Yeah, I grew up uh, in Toronto, not far from there. I'm like, uh, my parents are like Lauren Spadina. This is my oh. routine though, that I always just, anybody from Toronto, I'm like, what high school did you go to? You but, have uh, to, you have yeah, to break well, it all down. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah, which subway line did you take? Where did you go? Like, yeah, there's so much to like, yeah. Oh my God, like the best like food spots. I just think Toronto is the best city in the whole world. Obviously I'm a huge homer for it, but mm. having, and I'm sure you can kind of attest to it too. It's like you travel around the world and you get to do so many great things. Toronto is just uh, incredible. Let's that talk about the Grey Cup because that was mm. really cool that you guys got to play the Grey Cup. You guys and the Lumineers, like what all went in to that show because I mean, you guys were rehearsing you were like yeah. walking and singing it was a <laughs> whole deal yeah a whole you know, song and dance it, it's a good question because and i like talking about it because we built up this skill set of being a live live band right and we we i think we are we're getting pretty good at that and knowing how to you know relate to an audience and connect with an audience but putting on a show for television as you know is much different than entertaining a live audience mm -hmm. and there's some overlap but there's a lot of things that you just do much differently if you're only thinking about the TV viewer at home. And the Grey Cup for uh, our American listeners and watchers is like the Super Bowl of Canada. It's like the final game in the Canadian Football League. We were the halftime show. And we got to build out this like 15 minute musical performance any way we wanted. And uh, to their credit, they allowed us to sort of take full creative control and we got to build out this sort of like medley of songs of our kind of biggest material. We invited the Lumineers up and the Lumineers are one of our favorite, you know, folk rock bands in America. Who doesn't love them? Some Lumineers, come on. Right? And we played on one of their songs. They played on one of our songs. Uh, and Kay Flay, who's an amazing uh, sort of multi-genre artist from LA, she came up and did a song with us that we have together. You Can Get It is what it's called. And... Uh, it was a lot though. It was all live on television. So you, there's no redos and you're kind of hoping that the, the people in the truck are cutting at the, at the right spots. Uh, so when we finished the show, we we're like, that all felt good. Right. And so we all gave each other the thumbs up there, but then it was like, okay, let's watch it back and hope that all the sort of sleight of hand stuff that we were trying to pull off and the lighting and everything looked as good as we hope. And they did an amazing job in the production side. So a huge shout out to yeah. them. What a huge accomplishment. I mean, okay. So what, you know, what was even the process of being asked to do the Grey Cup? <laughs> so I think the CFL has like a goal of trying to attract uh, big international uh, stars. Like the, the, the last time the Grey Cup happened, which was two years ago because of COVID, they couldn't have it the year before. Uh, they had Keith Urban uh, play and Keith Urban flew in from Nashville or wherever he was and he put on a great show. And, and before that, like Imagine Dragons have done it, um, Follow boy shania twain has done it and come on let's right? go girls hey <laughs> that's right and um <laughs> we and so but we've our names i think been thrown about 
when they're discussing it. And this year just kind of worked out, I guess, uh, maybe with the borders being shut down, they had no other choice but to give it the old Arkell. How Canadian we were- of you. That's very Canadian of you to downplay <laughs> this amazing accomplishment. It's really cool. Like, that's something you should be, I mean, obviously you are proud of it, but like, wow. Yeah, it was cool. You know, I think it was like one of those things where it's like, if someone were to ask, oh yeah, like, I want to go check out your band. Like, show me a thing you've done. I'm like, oh, this kind of like, encompasses everything we're about because when it, the band is a five-piece band that we met at university tim mike uh, nick and tony and i um and but we tour with this extended horn section so it beca- and singers the arquette so it turns into this big soul production so it's somewhere between like david byrne and talking heads with some like good old school like canadian rock and roll that's influenced by you know, like the band or, you know, uh, Bruce Springsteen. Mm-hmm. Uh, we love Neil Young. I know you love Neil Young. Love uh, some Neil Young. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so, and I think that kind of represents like what we're sort of about. And yeah, so it was, it was amazing, honestly. And like the other thing is, I know I mentioned earlier, I think everybody is like just looking for some kind of purpose in their life right now. You know, like everyone's like, what is a yeah. thing that I can chase after that I can dream about that kind of, I can wake up looking forward to. And for us, we got the call kind of early November that we were going to do the halftime show. It happened December 12th. So for like a month, we're like planning every single day. That's not very long. That's not a very long time to like get it together. No, it was, it was a ton of work. Yeah. Normally you have a little bit more time to prep, but I think everything's just been in flux. So yeah. Like what's the pyro going to look like? How are we going to transition from song to song? When are the Lumineers going to arrive? All all that. Uh, So it was, it was, it was a lot, but it was awesome. Like, I'm like, just give me another one of these projects. Do you have anything for me, Renee? Can you just uh, offer me any opportunity, please? (laughs) And if you want to come to Cincinnati, I have an extra chair here. You can jump on the show, no <laughs> the problem. Plant, right. The plant is very inviting. So the uh, plant is inviting. I just got a new Keurig machine up here. So ooh, giddy up. Nice. Let's go. I've got my Tim Hortons cup. <laughs> yeah, oh, are they a sponsor of this pot? They should be. Um, I'm constantly trying to get um craft dinner to sponsor me. So it's one thing at a time. Jeez, craft dinner pony up already. Let's well, go. They, you know, they did send me a lot of craft dinner, I will say. There's okay. no, there's no the monetary product doesn't gain count. from this, but that's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Give yeah, me the money. Let's go. Yeah. 